Um, thank you to Coptic Solidarity for organizing today and tomorrow's conference on such an important topic. Um, and thank you all for being here today uh, to signal by your presence the uh, importance that you attach to the problem of religious freedom globally uh, in the Middle East, and in particular, the, the plight of the persecuted church in the Middle East. Um, as a quick introduction, I, I want to spend some time talking about the persecution that Christians face today in the Middle East. Let's spend a couple of minutes talking about first principles. Why does it matter? Why does religious freedom matter to the United States, to the world? And then I'll talk about U.S. policy and some of the policy levers the United States can use to better promote the cause of religious freedom around the world and to address the plight of the persecuted church in the Middle East. Um, so let's start with a survey of trends in the Middle East. And as we all know, unfortunately, the situation for Christians in the region is grim. Of course, Christianity, like Christ himself, was born in the Middle East. Uh, Egypt's Christian community in particular dates back to biblical times. Uh, the Apostle Mark founded the Church of Alexandria, and he was later martyred in that very city. Uh, from those fundamental beginnings, uh, Christianity has thrived in the Middle East over the centuries, over the millennia. But the past century has been particularly devastating for the church. Uh, in 1900, Christians represented about 13% of the region's population. Today, it's about 4%, uh, a stunning, stunning loss uh, of a historical presence in the region. Uh, Egypt is something of an outlier in this respect. Now, a century ago, the Christian population of Egypt was about 15%, give or take. Today, it's roughly 10%, or about 10 million people. Um, it's about the largest Christian community in the region. And although Egypt has suffered a decline, a substantial decline over the last century, it is nothing compared to what our co-religionists have experienced in other parts of the region. Consider Turkey, for instance. In the 19th century, Turkey saw a Christian population of anywhere between 20 to 25%. By 1924, after a series of genocides and expulsions, the Christian population of the country was down to 2%. Today, less than half a percent. We see a similar trend in Iraq. At the turn of the millennium, the Iraqi population comprised about 1.2 million Christians. Today, it's just 120,000. The aftermath of the US invasion of the country in 2003 has proven to be devastating for the nation's Christian community. In Syria, in 2011, Christians accounted for about 1.5 million people in the population of that country. Today, after more than a decade of war, down to about 300,000. In Lebanon, when the country was founded in 1943, Lebanon was a majority Christian country. With Hezbollah now running a corrupt and violent state within a state for four decades running, the population is now down to 35%. Bethlehem, uh, is unfortunately a tragic microcosm of these broader trends in the region. In 1948, at the foundation of Israel, Christians represented 85% of the population of Bethlehem. Under Jordanian control, from 1948 to 1967, population dropped by more than half, down to 40%. Uh, rebounded a bit under Israeli control from 1967 to 1995, you saw the numbers inch up to about 65% of the population. But today, after three decades of the Palestinian Authority calling the shots in Bethlehem, 12%. So what's going on here? What, what accounts for these dramatic declines in longstanding Christian presence in the Middle East? It's very simple. Christians are voting with their feet. After enduring violence and persecution over the years, they have decided to flee their ancestral homelands for new homes that are more hospitable to those of the Christian faith, new homes that reflect and value religious pluralism and religious tolerance and religious diversity. Now, in some cases, we've seen local governments actively persecute Christians. In other cases, it's private actors that are responsible for the persecution, and the government officials are simply turning a blind eye. Either they like, lack the capability or they lack the intent 
to protect their Christian population from private violence. But ultimately, that's a distinction without a difference. Uh, let's be clear, whether a government is engaging in persecution itself or tolerating it, that government is responsible for the harms that befall a religious minority. And it must be held to account for failing to protect its population. We'll come back to that a little bit later. I've been throwing some numbers at you, but of course, numbers only tell part of the story of the lived experience of religious minorities in the Middle East. Um, so let's talk a bit about some examples of some of the persecution, some of the forms of persecution that Christians face around the region today. They faced prosecution in criminal court for professing their faith. They faced biased courts, biased other tribunals. They faced official discrimination from government offices and government officials. They faced the prospect of forced conversions. And of course, the nonstop threat of terrorist attack and other forms of sectarian violence that local governments either cannot or will not stop. Unfortunately, uh, our, our brothers and sisters in Egypt are all too familiar with all of these forms of discrimination, persecution, and violence. Uh, terrorism is perhaps uh, the best um, known example of these trends. Let's go back to New Year's Day in 2011. Uh, a bombing of a church in Alexandria killed 23 people. On Palm Sunday in 2017, ISIS terrorists killed dozens in coordinated church bombings in Tanta and Alexandria. In 2017, in May of that year, ISIS gunmen were responsible for killing 28 pilgrims on, a monast on the way to a monastery in Minya. The next year, in November of 2018, seven people were killed in a similar attack in the same place. In all, it's estimated that since 2015, ISIS has been responsible for killing at least 150 Egyptian Christians. Terrorism and sectarian violence are only the tip of the iceberg. And, and just beneath the waterline, there are plenty of other forms of discrimination, plenty of other forms of persecution that Christians and other religious minorities endure. Activists have been a particular target for persecution. Patrick Zaki, a man I'm sure is known to many in this room, was sentenced to three years in jail for speaking out about the plight of Copts in, in, in Egypt. Now, he eventually received a presidential pardon, in part after intervention from many officials in the United States government, executive branch and legislative branch alike. And we rightly celebrate uh, the just outcome in that case. But it never should have come to that. It shouldn't take a presidential pardon to ensure that the rights of free speech and freedom of expression are protected. And it's also a much bigger problem than one person. Other activists in the country and around the region, unfortunately, have not been so lucky. Christians in Egypt, Christians around the region also face the problem of biased courts and biased tribunals and other decision-making bodies. I'm sure you're all familiar with the case of Suad Thabet, a 70-year-old Coptic woman who was the victim of a savage hate crime after her son was falsely accused of uh, relationships with Muslim women, a mob accosted her. They stripped her naked, they beat her, and they dragged her through the streets. When those perpetrators were then prosecuted in a court of law, they were acquitted. And appellate courts have subsequently rejected this poor woman's appeals. Justice has been denied to her and to her family. Um, this represents, I'm afraid, uh, a, a rather persistent trend. After we see hate crimes or other acts of sectarian violence against Christians, it's often the case that authorities ask these victims to participate in so-called reconciliation sessions with their attackers, which do very little, if anything, to ensure justice for the victims, very little, if anything, to ensure accountability for the crimes committed, very little, if anything, to help deter future atrocities in the future. Attackers, again, escape accountability, victims are denied justice. We've also seen far too many examples of forced conversions, particularly targeted at vulnerable members of Christian communities. Um, sometimes widows are pressured to convert to Islam by money lenders uh, with a promise dangled in front of them that their debts will be forgiven if only they make a different religious choice. 
Then there's the problem of church construction and church renovation in Egypt. In 2016, to, to much international fanfare, the country adopted a new law purportedly speeding along the process of granting permission for churches to be constructed, churches to be renovated. Um, I'm afraid there's less here than meets the eye. The, the, the legal framework is still fundamentally discriminatory. Christians and only Christians are required to go through this uh, Kafkaesque, shall we say, uh, government approval process. It's fundamentally a discriminatory regime that only singles out uh, particular faith traditions. And of course, the government officials that are responsible for granting the necessary approvals sometimes like to drag their feet. It's a problem that all victims of bureaucracy can attest to, but it has particular salience when you're trying to create a building in which you can exercise your most sacred and fundamental right to the free exercise of religion. Um, mobs, as well, like to make churches targets of violence. Um, so that's Egypt, and unfortunately, the persecution, the harms, the suffering that the Egyptian churches have faced are all too representative of what others in the region have endured as well. Take Turkey, for instance. The half of a percent of the Christian uh, uh, population of the country now. Um, not so long ago, the Turkish government turned Hagia Sophia, the, the beautiful relic of, of Constantine's relic, the, the beautiful triumph of uh, Constantine's empire, uh, into a mosque after it having been um, a museum open to all faith traditions since the Ataturk era. Um, not so long ago, in fact, I think just within the past month, the Kora Church on the outskirts of Istanbul, near the ancient city walls, likewise underwent a, shall we say, forced conversion. Uh, it's now a mosque. The beautiful 14th century Byzantine mosaics um, that I had the privilege to, to, to see firsthand a number of years ago, are now hidden. They're now hidden behind a, a shroud. Um, and you have to peel back the shroud to see um, these beautiful uh, mementos of Constantinople's thriving Byzantine civilization. So why, why is this? Is there some shortage of mosques in Istanbul that I, I just haven't heard about? Uh, do, do, the, do the good people of Istanbul really lack for opportunities and, and locations for them to engage in their free exercise of religion? No, of course not. What's, what's going on here seems to be something more sinister. It seems to be, uh, it seems to reflect a supremacist attitude and a rejection of Turkey's century-old tradition of pluralism, tolerance, and respect for religious difference. Uh, that was incubated under Ataturk, but that has been under strain now for far too long. And of course, no one can talk about the plight of the church globally without talking about Nigeria. Uh, last year alone, terrorists and armed gangs reportedly killed more than 8,200 Nigerian Christians, and they kidnapped thousands more. Last year, at least 750 churches and other Christian sites were attacked by these terrorists and by these violent mobs. Christmas, the time of peace, was particularly bloody for our Nigerian brothers and sisters. Over a 48-hour period, 37 Christian communities were attacked by terrorists, at least 160 people were killed, and more than 220 homes were burned during this outburst of violence. In all, since the year 2000, more than 60,000 Nigerian Christians have been put to the sword. 60,000 Christians have been slaughtered in this country. And the government seems either powerless uh, or unwilling to stop this hurricane of violence. No wonder experts are calling this violence a silent genocide. So let me take a step back after having painted an admittedly bleak picture of world affairs to talk a bit about why this all matters. Why is religious freedom so important to us as Americans, to us as Christians, as Jews, as Muslims? Um, what is it about this value that entitles it to be in the First Amendment, not the third, fourth, or fifth? Why is this the first freedom? Well, I want to suggest that religious freedom is both an inherent good and an instrumental good. It's an inherent good in that it is intrinsically valuable for its own sake. It is a necessary condition for human flourishing. 
And this value, this concept, is reflected right there in headlines in the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. The relationship, the basic idea here is that the relationship between man and God is prior to the relationship between man and state. And therefore, the state has no legitimate authority to interfere uh, in the relationship between creator and created. From this basic principle, we derive the free exercise principle. Congress shall make no law interfering with, abridging the free exercise of religion. From this principle, we also derive the establishment clause. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, establishing a single national church to which all must belong or uh, pay loyalty. In addition to being an inherent good, religious freedom is also instrumentally valuable. It is valuable because it brings about other social conditions that are themselves valuable. Uh, there's an internal dimension to this as well as an external dimension to this. So the internal dimension, countries that tend to respect religious freedom tend to be politically stable, prosperous. Uh, it, they tend to exhibit high degrees of harmony across religious views, across social classes, and so on. Countries that do not respect religious freedom tend to exhibit the opposite traits. They tend to be plagued by domestic instability, by violence, and by poverty. There's an external dimension to this as well as concerns foreign policy. Countries that tend to respect religious freedom, like the United States, Western, uh, other Western democracies, they're not typically at war with their neighbors. They enjoy good relations with their neighbors. Uh, they don't fight wars of conquest. They're comfortable with the status quo in the international order. The same cannot be said for countries that represent the world's worst violators of religious freedom. These countries tend to be revanchist. They tend to seek to upend the international order with its protection for basic human rights. Um, and they represent often very often, security threats to their, to their neighbors uh, and to others they see as adversaries. Just to put it in concrete and practical terms, take a look at the State Department's list of countries of particular concern, the list of countries that engage in the most egregious forms of violations of religious freedom around the world. It includes such heavyweights as Burma, China, Cuba, Iran, North Korea, and Russia. Are you seeing a trend here? Does anybody want to live in Iran? If you live next to North Korea, do you feel secure? Absolutely not. And I don't think that it's a coincidence that violations, systemic violations of religious freedom and these domestic and external problems uh, are completely unrelated to one another. So. What, what can we do about it? What, what can we, as the United States government, that's not me anymore, I'm a private citizen like, like most of you in this room, but what can our, our government do to better advance the cause of religious freedom? What can we as concerned citizens do uh, to pressure the United States government and like-minded governments to do more to advance the cause of religious freedom? I think there's three things that, that need to happen. First, make religious freedom a priority. Second, tell the truth, and third, apply pressure to violators, even when it's hard. Let me walk through those one by one, um, and then we, can, uh, then we can break. First, you've got to make religious freedom a priority, and that means the President of the United States has to talk about this. There's no substitute for presidential leadership. That is how other countries know that it matters to the United States. If the President isn't talking about it, other countries will tune it out. It's simply not going to register. Um, and we have plenty of examples from recent American history where presidents have invested and expended substantial amounts of personal political capital in order to stand with persecuted Christians, Jews, Muslims, and other faith traditions around the world. Ronald Reagan and the Refuseniks in the Soviet Union is an excellent example of this. Um, Ronald Reagan consistently lobbied Soviet leadership, consistently spoke out in public about the plight of Soviet Jews 
who sought the opportunity to emigrate to Israel to escape the stifling restrictions on their faith in the Soviet empire um, and was ultimately successful in delivering good outcomes for so many. Why was he successful? Because it mattered to him and be because he talked about it um, and because he was willing to impose costs on adversary states like the Soviet Union um, in order to obtain those outcomes. We'll talk about those costs a bit more in just a second. A more recent example, one that I'm familiar with from my time at the State Department, concerned President Trump and his efforts to secure the release of Pastor Brunson in Turkey, who was wrongfully detained uh, by Erdogan's government, purportedly because of, I don't know, something to do with the coup in 2016. Um, I, it actually doesn't really matter what the charges were because they were spurious. Um, and that was the basis of President Trump's intervention. At one point, um, he threatened to crater the Turkish economy um, in President Trump's unique way. Um, whether or not you think that might be diplomatically untoward, there is no arguing that it got results. Uh, Pastor Brunson was on a plane home very shortly after that. And the relationship with Turkey didn't crater. Um, the relationship between Washington and Ankara uh, survived that um, uh, episode. Um, not despite the fact that we leaned hard uh, on Ankara to get our citizen back, but, but because they respected the fact that we were willing to go to the mat for principle. Um, so it's not just the president. The value, the importance of religious freedom also needs to be brought up by our diplomats, by our government officials, all the way up and down the chain of command, from the Secretary of State and other cabinet secretaries down to your uh, first tour diplomats who are out there in the field for the first time. Two, we've got to tell the truth. We, we have to be clear about what is actually happening to religious minorities when they face persecution. When they face discrimination, when they face persecution, we need to call a spade a spade um, and be honest about what is happening to them. We can't obfuscate. And, you know, I mentioned the Soviets a second ago. Let, let me borrow from the great Soviet dissident, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, live not by lies. Right? Live not by lies. I can't tell you how many times my briefers at the State Department would come in to my office and tell me, Nigeria is complicated. It's, it's, you know, there's farmers and herders, uh, there's a conflict over land use, or maybe it's northern tribes for, versus southern tribes, or um, some other explanation for the 60,000 dead Christians. And those, that may all be true. Those, those elements may all be present in a complex set of conflicts. But we also have to acknowledge the fact that there's 60,000 dead Christians. We also have to acknowledge the fact that religious bias, religious persecution, is at least part of the explanation for what we have seen befall this country uh, over the past quarter century. Um, obfuscation, not telling the truth, gives comfort to those who are doing the persecution, and it demoralizes those who are being persecuted. We gotta put an end to that. And then third and finally, the last policy response I want to talk about is applying pressure to countries that are violating religious freedom, even when it's hard, even when it's our allies that are doing it. Um, there's no shortage of tools that State Department officials, Treasury Department officials, and others could use. I don't want to bore you with a policy white paper, so I'll just hit the wave tops here. Um, you can use public diplomacy mechanisms to highlight this problem and drive up the reputational costs to countries of tolerating or engaging in religious persecution. You know, the State Department's list of countries of particular concern, uh, the State Department's list of special watch list countries, these are all uh, viable tools. Um, Next rung up the escalation ladder are U.S. sanctions authorities. You could use the Global Magnitsky Act to impose economic sanctions on bad actors who were violating religious freedom, freeze them out of the international financial system, deny them access to the U.S. banking system, deny them access to the U.S. dollar. I can't tell you how powerful these tools are. When I was at state and the Chinese Communist Party forcibly uh, absorbed Hong Kong, albeit without firing a shot, we responded by putting Hong Kong's chief executive on the U.S. sanctions list. She got paid in cash after that. Banks wouldn't touch her. Um, that's how powerful 
these economic sanctions are, and we need to make more robust use of them to address the plight of religious freedom violations. You can also use visa bans to prevent responsible officials from traveling to the United States. If you're gonna violate the, the, the conscience rights of your religious minorities, you're not coming to New York to go shopping on Fifth Avenue. Simple message. Further up the escalation ladder, you can use foreign assistance funding. Um, you can restrict foreign assistance funding. You can restrict security assistance to countries that do not have tolerable records, acceptable records when it comes to international religious freedom. If a government is not responsive to the concerns the United States has addressed, the response is simple. Instead of funding the government, we fund NGOs. We'll send the money to NGOs that are working to advance uh, the rights and interests of religious minorities in those countries. Frankly, we should be doing more of that anyway. So this won't be easy. It should be easy, but it won't be easy. Um, I can already hear the inevitable objections coming from the diplomatic corps. There's always a good reason not to take action. Well, the timing isn't right. There's an election coming up in the country. And we don't want to destabilize their domestic politics, and this would look bad for the prime minister, who's been a key ally of the United States, and the Russians are nosing around the country, and the Chinese are too, and we don't want to drive this country into the arms of our adversaries. All those things may be true, but look, either religious freedom is a priority or it's not. And if it's not, stop acting like it is and take that message to the voters so we can hold you accountable. Last word, it, it's easy, or at least, again, should be easy to impose costs on nation state adversaries like China, like Russia, like Iran, that are the worst of the worst when it comes to violating religious freedom. We've got to call them out, but I've got to tell you, it's just as important for us to call out our friends, our allies, our partners. That's how you know that this issue matters. If the United States is willing to put at risk key relationships, to risk friction or worse in key relationships in order to vindicate the rights of the persecuted church, persecuted Christians, Muslims, Jews, or other faith traditions. Um, and I, I can also tell you, the, the doom and gloom predictions about how bad things are going to get if the United States says, please stop killing 60,000 Christians, the, the, the doom and gloom scenarios are never going to play out in the worst case scenarios predicted by uh, US government officials. We're the United States. We have so much to offer the world. The world wants to do business with us. They want our technology. They want our investment. They want our military protection. There is a lot we can offer. They need us more than we need them in almost every single case you can think of. We can afford to act like a superpower because we are a superpower. We can afford to put religious freedom and other issues on the table and make other countries live up to our standards rather than apologizing for the First Amendment and hoping these problems go away. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for your commitment to this important issue. Um, and I appreciate, uh, appreciate the time to speak with you. Thank you.